staff. It's, it's a great honor for me to introduce to you tonight, or this afternoon, David Hume Kennerly. Uh, he is a director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation. He's also going to act as the MC. Uh, he's, David is the brainchild for putting this together, put a lot of effort uh, getting uh, the other White House photographers in line. This program was done earlier this year at the LBAJ uh, library, and we were hoping to one best him by getting uh, Obama's official White House photographer, but a few days ago he canceled, so we have four White House photographers. So thank you, David, for all your fine work in putting this together. Uh, James Earl Jones said David Hume Kennerly is like Forrest Gump, except he was really there. Uh, David has been working for more than 40 years, eight presidents, eight wars, and a number of, of countries uh, since then. 20, at the age of 25, he won a Pulitzer Prize in 1972 for his photographic uh, images of the Vietnam War. Two years later, uh, Gerald R. Ford just became president, and he uh, asked David Kennerly to be his official photographer. Since then, David has won numerous awards, one of which is one of the 100 most important photographers people in photography by American Photo Magazine. He's done over 50 magazine covers. He's done several books, Extraordinary Circumstance, The Presidency of Gerald R. Ford, and most recently, uh, with one of our other speakers, Bob McNeely, he's, they've published Barack Obama, the official inaugural book. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce David, and again, thank you for your uh, extraordinary service to the Foundation putting this program together. It's an honor to have David join us uh, on his travels across the country where he speaks. Thank you very much. You, All right. Every time I come to Grand Rapids, it's, uh, uh, it's not bright and shiny. I don't know why that is, <laughs> but as a native Oregonian, I'm, I feel right at home, so it's uh, not a problem. Uh, despite what you may think, I didn't take that photo. <laughs> I've been at it a long time. But it's great to be back here uh, uh, with my friends and colleagues uh, from uh, the small but illustrious group of former White House photographers. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a little rundown of my talk about uh, how this all came to be. But uh, following me will be uh, David Valdez, who was uh, George Bush's photographer. And people want to call him George Herbert Walker Bush, but he really was George Bush. Uh, David had worked with Bush as a, the vice presidential photographer for eight years, and then he became his uh, chief. And you'll be seeing his photographs. And then following him is uh, Bob McNeely. Uh, Bob was Bill Clinton's photographer, which uh, in many ways, and Bob's also a Vietnam vet, by the way, and I could equate some of what he went through during that presidency with being in combat. Uh, he had a, a vigorous subject, no question about it. And um, Eric Draper, who spent uh, eight years with uh, George W. Bush. Uh, Eric and I first met when he was um, uh, working for AP uh, during the Pat Buchanan campaign. We were talking at lunch today. I said, well, if Buchanan had become president, he would have been his White House photographer, no doubt. Uh, that would have been interesting. <laughs> but, um, and then uh, the only remaining living White House photographers, uh, the fifth is Pete Souza, who couldn't make it. Uh, he went on a little vacation with the Obamas this weekend, apparently, and just the three of them. So, uh, should be really exciting. Anyway, <laughs> but I'm sorry he wasn't here. We planned this whole thing around being a weekend, good chance he could be here and all that. Uh, there never has been a time, and uh, up to date, certainly, uh, we're all of us gathered in one spot. Um, but I think I'll just start showing you some pictures. I'll talk about the, the history of White House photography, the White House photo office, uh, how it came to be. This picture, actually the first president to uh, really understand the power of photography was Abraham Lincoln. And this picture was taken of Lincoln shortly before his uh, Cooper Union speech in New York, same day in a studio that Matthew Brady had. And Lincoln said that that picture and, and my Cooper Union speech won him the presidency. And ironically, 
the next president who really, really understood photography was John F. Kennedy. And uh, Kennedy uh, was obviously a young, attractive guy. He had a, a beautiful wife, two great kids, probably a dog or two. And he let in all sorts of outside photographers. The, the official White House uh, photos were taken by military photographers who really had very little access. But Kennedy let people in to shoot pictures of him and the family all along. And uh, this was by Jacques Lowe, one of the really great photographers. And look at that. This was a campaign picture for Kennedy. I mean, you can see why we. <laughs> uh, it's either a picture or a Norman Rockwell painting. It's pretty hard to just <laughs> say the difference between them. And Stanley Tredick uh, took this picture. Now, you've seen the, the other photo, but I love this. There's a shoe right under the president's feet there, and Pierre Salinger probably talking about bombing Cuba or something. <laughs> Meanwhile, John John Jr. is um, uh, in there. Uh, I actually ended up working with John many years later when he ran George Magazine and uh, had a, a great relationship with him. This is the photo that's really a famous picture of uh, by Stan Tredick, who was a UPI photographer, a former wire guy also. And it was Robert Kennedy and Vice President Johnson and the Oval Office. These photos were all taken by civilians. And um, uh, it, it was interesting that there wasn't a, a civilian at that time. I, I'm surprised, and I don't know why, he didn't just hire somebody that he liked. And a very famous photo is by George Thames of the New York Times. Uh, he called this the loneliness, loneliest job in the world. And um, I said, wow, what was he doing, George? I said, he must have been making some big decision. He said, well, actually, I think he was reading the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes pictures aren't uh, exactly what you think they might be. Um, and this is John, this is by Stan Tredick, John in his dad's uh, chair right outside the Oval Office. And then sadly, uh, this is John uh, in another famous photograph saluting at his father's funeral in Washington, D.C. And Cecil Stoughton, who was a, uh, a military photographer, took this picture on Air Force One, uh, Lady Bird Johnson and, and uh, uh, Linda Johnson being sworn in as president after Kennedy was shot. And Cecil had, along with the other military photographers, were around, but Johnson didn't really like uh, the military guy's photographs. And he had traveled with a guy by the name of Yochi Okamoto, who was, uh, um, when, when Johnson went overseas, uh, uh, Oki worked for USIA. And so one day, Johnson, declared that he wanted to get that Japanese photographer in here uh, working for me. So these are some of the pictures Oki took. And the thing about Okamoto, he had incredible access. He really showed the person who Lyndon Johnson was. It was a extraordinary uh, photos that, that Oki took. Odi, Oki really set the standard for all of us who have follow, followed in his path. He was uh, the first civilian White House photographer. Here he is with Martin Luther King. You can see Oki's just right in there. Make sure these kind of pictures just put you right in the room, right in the meeting. Um, you can see the FDR in the background. I love all the detail in the photos. And uh, Oki had a great eye. He shot everything with black and white. With Westmoreland waiting. Down. This is down at the ranch in Texas. And during a, a speech, this is one of his grandkids in the Oval Office. But a lot of our photography in the, uh, covering the White House was not just about the person himself. It was about uh, the attendant things, uh, people who worked there and all that. Now, this photo uh, was not made by Oki, but was made by uh, Jack Keitlinger, who ended up working with me and uh, with some of the other guys. Uh, Jack was a former Army photographer who uh, Oki brought on board as a civilian. And Johnson was in the cabinet room listening to a tape from uh, his son-in-law, Chuck Robb, later became a senator, from Vietnam. 
And this was one of the powerful moments uh, in the LBJ presidency. In the transition then after LBJ went to Richard Nixon, one of the most famous pictures and the biggest selling photo at the Nixon Library is this one. <laughs> a pair of kings, somebody called it. But um, I love this. This one they sell like hotcakes at the museum. And with Ollie Atkins was a Saturday evening post photographer. Ollie was a uh, um, very conservative guy, pinstripe suits and all that, and, and had very little access to Nixon. Uh, but he'd come in and get a couple of pictures and have to get out. And so it was almost exactly the opposite of what Oki had. Now in this picture, you'd think it's a really nice family moment. You've got uh, uh, son-in-law, uh, uh, Trisha Nixon, Mrs. Pat Nixon, and David and Julie Eisenhower. This is right after he told him he was resigning the presidency. This picture was taken uh, August 7th of 1974. And Ollie was in the room and got some of these pictures. The one on the right with the kind of goofy looking uh, uncomfortable moment there on the left hand side has always been run cropped with Nixon hugging Julie. This is in the solarium, third floor of the White House. And an another thing, I went to a minute this edit, I was always so how, why all the space on the right where you had a distraught Tricia uh, Nixon over on the left? I mean, the dog was the only one that was kind of like uh, comfortable in the moment. But these pictures, and then this is Nixon telling the leadership uh, San, uh, uh, with um, uh, senators and, and the leaders of the House, Carl Albert and Mike Mansfield, uh, that he was resigning. This was in his private office, and this is him coming down the stairs with Ron Ziegler. Everything was like shot from a distance. And, and uh, this is President, Vice President Ford waiting to go in to see Nixon, and this is the moment, really. Uh, this is the day before uh, uh, Nixon left. And this is Ollie on the left um, taking photos that day. Everything was from, it's like almost arm's length kind of photography. If you looked at the Johnson stuff, it was just the opposite from that. And then meeting with uh, Gerald Ford, uh, last meeting they had in the Oval Office become before Ford actually sat in the chair. And then the night that Nixon read, on August 8th, he read the um, speech. You know, this will give you an idea of what happened with uh, um, Ollie Atkins. And, and it's actually very scary for me having then worked later in this place. Uh, okay, just listen to Ollie. Only the CBS crew now is to be in this room during this. Only the crew. No, there no there will be no picture. No, after the broadcast. You've taken your picture, didn't? Didn't you take one just now? That's it. Uh, because you know we don't want it. We, we didn't let the the press is going to take one, so you've taken it and you just take it right now. This is right after the broadcast. You got it? Come on. Okay. Well, um, this was the photo he took <laughs> here. And, you know, I, I'm very sympathetic to Ollie. I knew him. He worked for me for a while after uh, Ford took over. But can we get this light turned down a little bit? I don't know who's doing that, but uh, my, the pictures might show up better, I think. Um, so this the last shot taken by Ollie with the White House in the background. I'm way in the back there. You won't even be able to see me, but on the press stand with all the other photographers. And this was my view of Nixon leaving. Uh, this is my contact sheet at the lower left-hand frame. Nixon's looking back up toward the White House. And you can see what the angle was. If, if, if you were Nixon in this position, you'd be looking right up uh, on, at the White House and uh, in this whole sequence of him. and. Then he does this kind of V for victory thing, uh, uh, but it was a, the White House staff was applauding and that's why he was reacting to them. And, but it was not a happy moment, certainly. It was a dark moment in political history. That's a close up of uh, the moment. And then the Fords watching Nixon leave, with David and Julie uh, on the left. And uh, this book uh, just came out recently. I put it together. Uh, to the generosity of a lot of former Ford people and others who uh, was published with the University of Texas Press. 
Uh, I think they have copies out. We're going to be out signing some of these books afterwards if anybody's interested. But this is really a two and a half year photo essay on the Ford presidency. And the night uh, that Ford became president, I'd been invited to, to his residence. It was a very modest place over in Alexandria, Virginia. And um, uh, he wanted to ask me about how I saw the White House photo job and all that. This is after everybody had left. I'm sitting on the couch with him. And all I could think about was Ollie Atkins and how Ollie never got anything and, um, and about Okamoto and how he had everything. And I told the president, I said, well, there are only two things that I would need uh, to work for you. One would be total access and the other would be to report directly to you, not the press secretary or the chief of staff. He said, you don't want Air Force One on the weekends? <laughs> so here I am on Air Force One. If it wasn't the weekend. This, uh, he had a very good sense of humor, and it, particularly having it, putting up with me for two and a half years. But um, uh, this plane, by the way, if you ever get out to California to go visit the Ronald Reagan Library, <clears throat> this plane is on display there. You can walk through it. It's amazing uh, uh, to see it. There's a huge atrium and it's hanging in there. It's very, very spectacular. But this was one of the early pictures. Uh, the empty shelves, all the Nixon stuff is gone. You could. I was <clears throat> given the job, um, and I took the job with the understanding uh, between us that we had discussed. And um, I felt like Okamoto in action. I could feel, I could see how he enjoyed it. And Johnson probably allowed Oki's pictures more out of a sense of vanity, where President Ford uh, uh, and I just had a great personal relationship. He liked my photos, but he didn't really care about how he looked, like, and he was not vain at all, which makes it a lot easier for a photographer. This is a Bush Sr. You'll see more photos of him later from David Valdez. Uh, Bush in this picture is probably 51 years old. Ford made him as director, well, first uh, as representative to the People's Republic of China, and then um, director of the CIA. Right after Ford pardoned Nixon, it was early September 8th, uh, the 31st day of his presidency, I took this picture after he'd already signed the pardon. This was in uh, uh, an office right down the hall. They still had Nixon's picture on the wall with uh, Gerald Ford's uh, VP photo. When I showed this picture to Alan Greenspan later, uh, he said, as usual, I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> apparently that has carried throughout his career, according to <laughs> recent events. But on the left, next to the president, is Donald Rumsfeld. And then putting a cigarette out on an ashtray is Dick Cheney. Now, th this is liberty. There was, uh, there's no. White House should be without a dog, and so uh, Susan Ford and I conspired to give the Fords a, a golden retriever. And I don't think she was looking to me as much as she was trying to avoid those pants, would be my guess. <laughs> and the Fords, uh, this is after Mrs. Ford came out of Bethesda Naval Hospital. It was their uh, anniversary. Um, I had an extremely good relationship with both the President and Mrs. Ford as witnessed by this picture, which ironically was, that's the same place Nixon was sitting like uh, just a few weeks earlier this is the, in the solarium. And then with President Ford uh, on the left is Terry O'Donnell, who's the uh, gatekeeper, the personal assistant, the Secret Service guys in the back. But I had an extremely fortunate circumstance for me to be able to get in and take the pictures. This is a, a rare photo of Henry Kissinger listening to somebody. <laughs> but in the Oval Office, uh, Ford was a big admirer of, um, of Harry Truman, and there's a bust of Truman on the left that you can see there. Um, he was, uh, 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 he really believed in get, agreeing, disagreeing without being disagreeable. Um, one of the key moments uh, that I took was under a portrait of Teddy Roosevelt. This was the moment Ford decided to pull out of Vietnam, surrounded by the director of CIA, uh, secretaries of state, defense. Uh, this is a very top secret meeting in the Roosevelt Room. And another big event was the uh, Mayaguez. Uh, that chart is proposed when uh, all this attack is going to take place to... Um, 
try to release uh, 75 Americans that were held hostage on an American ship taken by the Khmer Rouge. And um, Bill Colby, the director of the CIA's briefing. And for all of us, in the, we all share the same thing with the kind of access we had. We all have to have top secret clearances at the minimum. And uh, uh, because probably nobody spent more time with the president than the photographer. And during the Miguez crisis, I think this is the point where Gerald Ford really came into the presidency. Uh, he, he ran this operation. Um, and as a former naval officer in World War II, he had seen combat. He was uh, not afraid to make decisions. And this was one of the big ones, uh, literally re sending an attack to get these people back. Uh, Bush, as the director of the CIA here on the left, uh, at and uh, Chairman uh, of the Joint Chiefs, George Brown, in the foreground. When we did this uh, interviews for the book, Tom Brokaw and I worked on that together, and uh, Brokaw was interviewing Kissinger and showing him all these photographs, and he says, who is that person sitting next to me? And Brokaw says, well, that's Dick Cheney. He says, my god, he's put on weight. <laughs> <laughs> then he said, realizing he shouldn't have said that on camera, as we all have. I said, well, maybe you did, Mr. Secretary, but uh, <laughs> this is the Godfather Three moment in uh, <laughs> California with Ronald Reagan at the Century Plaza Hotel. Reagan was governor, would later run against Ford for the Republican nomination. This is the picture that kept President Ford off the best dress list. <laughs> On the right is Donald Rumsfeld, very nicely attired. But this was, this was in the Akasaka Guest Palace in uh, Tokyo, 1974. And we went on to Vladivostok on that same trick. And the president had been given a wolf coat, you're talking about not PC, uh, uh, on the way out to, uh, uh, through Alaska. And Brezhnev admired the coat and wanted it, and President Ford gave it to him. And as any of the other guys will tell you, this is um, our opportunity to be seeing other great leaders, you would never have a chance. Uh, Brezhnev of the Soviet Union, Deng Xiaoping in China, 1975, Anwar Sadat in Alexandria, Egypt. And people always ask me what this is. <laughs> and yeah, you have to admit that President Ford's a sport, whatever they were doing. This was a state dinner in Kyoto with geisha girls, geishas, uh, it's kind of I'm sorry to say this, Bob, the kind of state dinner Bill Clinton would have killed for, probably. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it's kind of like our pass the apple uh, trick, you know, and there's a straw, and they pa pass it over and hold it with your lip to your nose, and uh, that worked out. Donald Rumsfeld put his own spin on it. <laughs> Rumsfeld was very amusing to the geisha, I want you to know. And then Henry Kissinger. <laughs> It's a good thing I didn't work for Henry. My job would have ended with that photograph. <laughs> and this was backstage after Ford had beaten um, uh, Reagan for the Republican nomination. This is back in uh, Kansas City. This is what I saw. Ford, uh, President Ford was really an uh, easy guy to get along with uh, unless you crossed him, which is what he thought Reagan had done. And, and uh, this is Reagan then uh, at the convention uh, Rockefeller, everybody, Bob Dole, who was Ford's running mate. And then a sad moment, which was inside, in the Oval Office after uh, Jimmy Carter had beat uh, Ford. And this was the moment that Ford really congratulated Carter in the Oval Office. And Mrs. Ford, I had upstairs, downstairs access there. I could go anywhere, anytime. And uh, I, I like when I'm not around McNeely and everybody, uh, but... Uh, particularly Bob and I shared a lot of these stories. And uh, in, during his period there, you can ask him about it afterwards, but uh, I always saw it as kind of like North and South Korea. And the DMZ was uh, it, certainly going upstairs in the White House. Mrs. Clinton really ran her shop and Bill Clinton ran his. Mrs. Ford had her own office and everything, but I, I got along with her to the degree that she just let me come and go. And I took this picture where she didn't know it looking out toward the uh, Oval Office. And uh, she always thought this was a very significant photo, kind of 
put her in a, like a, in a cage looking out sometimes how she felt. Um, and, uh, but the day uh, before Jimmy Carter took over, January 19th, 1977, Mrs. Ford and I were wandering around uh, the West Wing and she was saying goodbye to people and we came by the cabinet room and she looked in there and this real bastion male domain, uh, uh, very few women cabinet officers had ever sat at that table at this point. And, she said, you know, I've always wanted to dance on the cabinet room table. And so um, she did, actually. <laughs> this is pre-Photoshop also. And um, I didn't want to use this. The picture was not published for years. After they left office, she went to uh, rehabilitation for alcohol and other problems and uh, has talked about that herself, certainly. I didn't want people making fun of this. And it was a very straight moment. She's a former Martha Graham dancer with a pixie-like sense of humor. So several years later, I was doing another book called Photo Op, and uh, I'd gone over to the desert, and I had the early layouts, and I, I put this picture in the layout to show it in the context that it was not all about this picture. It was just another shot, and she wasn't there. And Mrs. Ford, uh, President Ford was there, so I showed him the book, and I got to this page, and he goes, oh, Betty's not going to like that. And I thought, oh, man, I'm sunk. Uh, nobody uh, knows her better than he does. And so she showed up and went through the book, got to this page, and, and President Ford said, well, Betty, you never told me you did that. And she just smiled at him and said, there are a lot of things I haven't told you, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, you don't mind if I use the picture? She said, no, it's great. That was the first time she'd seen it. And this is the inauguration. Carter sworn in with uh, Warren Berger behind. Uh, this was... Actually, at this moment, I went to work for Time Magazine. It was like 12.01, uh, uh, the, the oath of office. I'm now a civilian. Took this picture uh, looking back. Uh, this is from the helicopter looking down on the uh, Capitol. And then, uh, sadly, and uh, uh, I know a lot of you have visited the Gerald R. Ford gravesite, but uh, the family had asked me to cover the funeral for them as part of the uh, my really a, a for responsibilities from the other time. This is Ford, President Ford's casket going up into the uh, house side of the uh, US Capitol. And then a picture I took from up above. And th this was really the temple of Gerald R. Ford. He, he went into Congress in 1948 and uh, uh, he loved being in the house. And uh, his greatest ambition really was to be Speaker of the House, which never happened. And then Carter took over, and I'm going to go, because another thing that happened, there was kind of a break in the lineage of uh, White House photographers. Uh, Jody Powell, who was uh, Jimmy Carter's press secretary, um, when asked who was going to be the new White House photographer, said, oh, we don't want another David Kennerly in the White House, so we're not going to have one. <laughs> and they actually kept a couple of the people, three of the people who worked for me on as just staff photographers. But one of the great moments, I, I ended up covering Carter a little bit. This is something I did from uh, uh, his greatest achievement, really, was uh, Sadat and Begin, the Camp David Agreement. Then on to Ford, beat him after four, uh, one, one term. This is Ronald Reagan. And this picture of the Reagans, uh, I, I had remarkable access to the Reagans. Mike Deaver, who really kind of ran the image thing for Reagan, um, would allow me and others to come in all the time. Mike Evans, the White House photographer, uh, was a dear friend and uh, former New York Times guy, also a Time Magazine guy, uh, was very open to that. And uh, But Deaver was the guy calling the shots. But this picture never got published, and I was shooting for time. They said it was too schmaltzy. And I said, but that's how they are. You know, this is not a joke. This picture was, like, happening. And then inside the Oval Office... Very good access with Reagan. Um, I'm going to go through these. To, then the big moment for Reagan, outside of getting shot by John Hinckley, probably, was um, this one, which is the, the, really the photo that was the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union domination. Uh, and uh, this is Reagan and Gorbachev in Geneva, 1985. And you can see Gorby was enamored with Reagan. This is after the, that big meeting broke up with it just been the two of them and the interpreters in the room, and I was able to be in there part of that time. And then the next meeting ended in disarray with uh, 
you could see it on Reagan's face that he was unhappy with him over Star Wars, which is this missile defense system. And then after he died, this is a picture of mine that uh, Time used as the lead photo of Reagan. And the five presidents, this is President Bush at this point, Reagan, Carter, Ford and Nixon at this point, those are the five presidents I covered. The first time that five had ever stood together on, on the same ground and uh, it was a very big moment. Uh, I was trying to do a kind of a Mount Rushmore-like moment and, and I took a chance and went off to the side and Reagan sensed that there was somebody over here and looked over, just a great actor, and that really made this picture. <laughs> David Valdez, not the ship, the photographer, coming up next. Thank you, David. Um, everybody asks, all the other guys got into the job as the White House photographer through the media. And, and um, uh, my first really awareness of, of a White House photographer and what they do was really David and, and seeing the access that, that he could have and how he did his photography. So. Vice President Bush, um, about a year or so into uh, his vice presidency, had um, uh, an opening for a, a staff photographer. So I figured if, if David Kennerly can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> so, so I went ahead and decided to, uh, to write a letter. And, and what I did is rather than send a letter to the White House personnel office, I targeted uh, uh, Shirley Green, who was the acting press secretary at the time, wrote her a letter. I'm a Texan. Everybody on the staff was from Texas. So I, I made the cut. It, it, it was kind of interesting. Um, I was telling David the other night uh, this story about um, that interview. And um, uh, I had to interview with, with Shirley Green, the press secretary. I had to interview with Admiral Dan Murphy, who was the chief of staff. And uh, that was a very, very difficult interview. He was pushing my buttons. He was a retired admiral, and I think he was trying to see my temperament. And and you know, one thing about a, a White House photographer is is you you want that access. You have to have that access to to do what you need to do. But you also need to be kind of quiet and be able to know when to come in, know when to leave. And, and uh, uh, so my interview with Admiral Murphy, I laughed and I thought, there is no way that I'm going to get this job. Well, then I got called back uh, to interview with Vice President Bush. And I go into his office in the old executive office building. And he's showing me some family pictures. And, and uh, he's saying, you know, you're going to spend a lot of time with me. You're going to spend a lot of time with the family. And I was like, w w wait a minute. Um, I get the impression from this conversation that I've already been hired and, and no one said anything about the salary. <laughs> so I said, do you know what the salary is? And, and, and he said, well, no, I actually have no idea. Let's call Admiral Murphy. So we're, we're in the old executive office building in, in the vice president's office and, and the chief of staff's office is the next room over and, and he called him on the phone. And I heard Admiral Murphy through the walls screaming that, you know, what, Valdez is asking you about salary? And I thought, oh boy, here we go. So um, um, I got hired. <laughs> and, and, and that was the December of uh, 83. And the Bushes had gone on down to um, uh, Miami for a little uh, time off during Christmas. And, and they flew me down there. And um, um, the, I went to where the Bushes were staying and, and actually got to meet Barbara Bush for the first time and had breakfast with them. And, and later on that day, um, uh, we did an event up in Miami and uh, President Bush's son, and whenever I say President Bush, I'm talking about senior President Bush. Um, his son Jeb, uh, they just had a baby and, and he was meeting the baby for the first time. And we go to this hotel suite and, and um, uh, so Jeb brings in uh, little Jeb 
and he introduces him to his father and uh, his grandfather. And I took some pictures, and 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 it was it was a funny moment because it was day two or three on the job, and and uh, uh, everybody left, and and the vice president took the baby back into the bedroom in the suite, and I'm looking around, and I said, oh, "There's nobody here to tell me what to do or what not to do." I said, "Kennerly would go in there." So I went into the bedroom and took pictures, and, and he was playing with the kid. Well, a few weeks later, I get a note from Barbara Bush, and she says, love the pictures you took. As long as you take good pictures of my grandchildren, you can go anywhere and do anything you want to do. <laughs> so I was golden from that point on. <laughs> now, now, David um, showed you the picture of the five presidents, and he said, well, that's the first time they had stood together. Well, actually, this was about 10 minutes before that. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, this is at the, Ronald, at the opening of the Ronald Reagan um, Presidential Library. And they had a mock-up of the Oval Office. And if you go upstairs here, you can see a very similar scene. They have a beautiful uh, mock-up of the Oval Office. And um, President Bush was president at the time. And I said to President Bush, I said, Mr. President, turn around for a picture. Well, when I said, Mr. President, turn around for a picture, <laughs> they all turned, and, and I had this 60th of a second moment. So th this is down in Houston, Texas, uh, the night that uh, Vice President Bush was elected president. And uh, you can see just under the arm there, George W. Uh, and, and the family all together there. And, and I think you, you'll see in, in the theme of my photos that, that family was the, the biggest part of, of uh, the, the whole Bush era. They, they all revolved around the family. And, and years later, after President Bush left, you know, they, people were asking him, you know, what's your greatest accomplishment as president? And, and he said, the, the fact that my children still come home and he was prouder of that uh, than anything. And, and uh, you know, when his son became president, it was, it was really something for him to be proud of. And of course, now here we are. This is Vice President Bush on, on Inauguration Day with a couple of the grandchildren over at the Blair House, which is the president's guest house across the street from the White House. And then, um, uh, we're saying goodbye here to uh, former President Reagan. And you can see the uh, uh, quails up the top of the steps. And then one last goodbye. And then, of course, the, the um, inaugural parade. And I guess President Carter got out and, and walked uh, on the parade. and, and uh, President Bush decided to do that. He was a really athletic guy, and, and uh, so it was, a, it, was, it was a beautiful day, so we went out and, and walked. And then, of course, at the inaugural balls, and, and the little girls there, Barbara and Jenna Bush, the daughters of uh, George W. And Barbara Bush, the, one of the inaugurals. And then Bar this is Barbara Bush at their home in Kenny Bunkport. And, and I wound up going um, to Kenny Bunkport hundreds and hundreds of times when they'd go on vacation and we'd go on, on marathon uh, golf days, boating days, tennis days. This is at, at one of the um, um, on the side of the tennis court at their home. And that's their home up in, in Kenny Bunkport and, and, and the immediate family. Um, uh, you can see on the far left is uh, uh, Neil and his wife, and then George W. and Laura Bush, and uh, their other son, Neil, and his wife in the background. And next to the tricycle is Doro. And uh, then on the far right here is Jeb and his family. And for quite a few years, I would take the, the family photos for them. And I spent a lot of time with them. I, I just had a, a thing happen in my family. My, a couple of weeks ago, my mother passed away, and, and a few days before that, Barbara Bush had been in the hospital, and, and uh, um, 
I had sent a note saying, you, you know, I was sending out my prayers to, uh, for the recovery health of Barbara Bush. And then uh, a few days later, my mother passed away unexpectedly. And, and literally the next day, I got this beautiful uh, uh, note from uh, President Bush. Uh, um, and, and I think, you know, I mean, he was that way with writing notes. I know all these guys probably all have personal notes from President Bush. But uh, um, when his mother passed away, I was with him. Uh, that last day or two that she was alive, and, and uh, they, they were at their home in, in Connecticut, and they had um, all of the family there and, and, and the extended family, and uh, he wanted a, a photo with his mother before she passed away, and you know they called me in, and I wound up taking a photo of he with his mother, so we've had that kind of life experience together. Here's the vice president with the grandchildren um, at the vice president's house, and then President Bush uh, with the grandchildren, and that's the Oval Office back in the background there. So, so, so th this photo was, was kind of funny. Um, uh, the uh, Life magazine wanted to do a story on, on the Bushes uh, while they were on vacation in, in Kenny Bunkport, and they wanted to send photographer over to, to shoot the photos. And, and the Bushes said, you know, I'm on vacation. No. And, and Life magazine was kind of shocked uh, that somebody would say no to them. And, and um, so there was some banter back and forth. And so finally, I was offered up. And they said, well, you know, David Valdez is here. He can shoot the photos. And, and um, uh, you know, they weren't too keen on, on that because they didn't know my name. And, and so they said, well, OK. So I shot this photo. And, and um, uh, it wound up running two full pages in Life magazine. And then after that, you know, over the years, I had many photos of the Bush family in, in Life magazine. So it was, it was kind of fun. But, but uh, that was a typical day uh, up in, in Kenny Bunkport. Uh, it was, I had talked to the Bushes about this, and, and in particular Barbara Bush, and she, and she told me, you, you know, if you really want to see what the family is like behind the scenes, come over to the house about 6:30 in the morning, and and so I went, and you know they were still in bed, and and I sat over here in this chair, and and um, uh, just kind of waited around, took a couple of snaps, and and uh, you know then this scene kind of unfolded in front of me, and and. So, so it, it's. I, I was with the Bushes so oh, two or three months ago, and and we were talking about you know like favorite photos, and and this one always comes back. Vice President Bush uh, traveled to communist Poland and met with shipyard worker Lech Walesa, and Lech Walesa said, "Someday, Poland will be free," and and. You, George Bush, will be president of the United States. Well, sure enough, uh, Poland did become free. And we went back. Uh, this is in, in Warsaw and met with um, uh, Lech Walesa, President Lech Walesa, in a free Poland. This is um, uh, just off the Oval Office. Um, and the president has a little study there. and. Um, uh, they were watching CNN, and, and uh, when George Bush was president, uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait, and uh, um, they had this um, coalition to, to get Iraq out of Kuwait. And the foreign minister uh, from uh, Kuwait was on, uh, from Iraq, was on uh, TV saying, "No, we have a right to be there." And, and it was kind of this moment that they decided, well, you know, we're going to have to go and, and remove Iraq from Kuwait. And then this is upstairs in, in the residence of the White House. And, you know, like David and some of the other guys, you know, I had all access to those areas. And this, at the time, was a highly classified meeting, you know, talking about the, the war plans. Um, and you know some of the familiar faces, but probably the most familiar um, 
for some of the older guys is, is Brent Scowcroft, who, who's kind of been consistent in the background to, through several presidencies, who was the National Security Advisor, and of course, Colin Powell is Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. 100 days later, uh, the war was over, and uh, Colin Powell is calling Norman Schwarzkopf and saying, that's it, uh, it's over. And, um, um, you know, some people say, well, you know, what's the deal with the phone and the desk? And there was really, it was, wasn't like some bat phone or anything. It was just, uh, you know, a big phone and they had to have some place to put it. But it, I always get questions about that. And then, of course, we had the, the, the campaign for re-election. And, and again, we were talking about this the other day. And, and um, um, one of the things, you know, there was a guy by the name of Ross Perot who uh, was an independent who was going to run for president. And then he decided not to run. And then he was going to run again. And, and um, actually, Bob was saying that on the, on the Clinton campaign, they were like, who's this guy? And what, how do, should we respond to him? And what, what's going on? And, and we were kind of the same way. It was like, what's going on? And, and well, ultimately, uh, Ross Perot um, split the Republican vote, and, and George Bush lost the reelection. So this is um, uh, President Clinton uh, congratulating former President Bush. And kind of at this moment, I too was unemployed, and um, I saw the picture David had taken many years earlier, and I just had a very similar photo. And then after we left the presidency, um, um, uh, Jeb Bush, uh, George Bush's son, was uh, elected uh, uh, governor of Florida, and George W. Uh, ran for president. And this is one of his uh, inaugural ball photos. And, and then this is another time some of the former presidents got together. I was actually invited by um, uh, Martin Luther King's family to photograph the funeral services of Coretta Scott King a few years ago. And, and uh, President Carter, Bush, Clinton, and Bush um, all showed up uh, uh, for the um, funeral service. And it was kind of interesting because none of them knew that I was there with the family. And, uh, you know, I kind of knew the drill with the holding rooms and all that stuff. And <coughs> so, so the um, uh, Bush advance staff, George W.'s advance staff, was calling me because they knew me and knew I was with the family. And, trying to work out the timing of that when we were going to arrive and when they were going to arrive. And we wound up getting this picture, so it was kind of interesting. And then, of course, since George Bush has left office, um, um, they uh, christened the uh, USS uh, George Bush aircraft carrier. And, and this is his grandson, George P. Bush, um, who um, uh, is an uh, ensign in the Navy Reserve. And of course, you're all familiar with the skydiving. And, and people say, well, gee, you know, wh what parachute was I in? And I was like, no, actually, I was on the ground. And this is about 20 feet above the ground just before they landed. And then just last summer, um, I was so inspired by President Ford's plaid clothing style that I've <laughs> continued that tradition on. And I, and I was with. Uh, uh, President Bush's last summer and um, uh, had a chance to visit up in, 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 in Maine. And now I think uh, it's time for Bob McNeely. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, David. I think one of the things it's going to be interesting for folks as you look at all this is there's a, a sense of the different personalities involved of both the photographer and the presidents. But what I would hope, you know, out of all this work that we've done, because it is an extraordinary 
commitment to this job in terms of the time and what you have to do. And obviously, we're all aware, you know, today that uh, Pete Souza, who's Obama's photographer, felt he couldn't come because of his commitment to the job. I mean, the commitment is kind of 24-7 to do this and to leave some kind of a historical record of this person who was president. And with President Clinton, uh, I had been in Washington for quite a few years. I actually had gone there in 72 originally um, as a volunteer on the McGovern campaign and then uh, just really enjoyed politics and really enjoyed watching Richard Nixon get impeached, obviously, having worked for George McGovern, but and enjoyed the personalities. I mean, I've, my friendships with people like Kennerly and uh, on both sides of the aisle. I mean, one of the fun parts about Washington over the years, which seems to, uh, hopefully hasn't changed too much, is kind of in that town, the, the way that people do get together and talk about politics. And I, I'm, I actually left Washington in 2001 after 30 years. But I know those years, uh, Kennerly had me, I came to dinner a couple times with uh, President and Mrs. Ford. And um, actually one of the nicest times at one of those dinners in 1976, after having worked for McGovern in 72, I worked on the Carter campaign and went into the White House to photograph Jimmy Carter and Fritz Mondale. And I had the opportunity at a dinner one night to say to President Ford, you know, it would have cost me a job, but I wish you'd won. <laughs> um, after a few, months around Jimmy Carter. I think everybody kind of came to that conclusion. But now, actually, I don't even know where the button is here. I'm going to try that one. Is that it? Where, which? On the right, OK. So my inspiration, obviously, I, I mean, as I said, I've known Kennerly for a long time and have always loved black and white photography. Uh, there's a, a great quote uh, by Robert Frank, says, black and white are the colors of photography. And I sort of have believed in that. In, when I uh, was offered the opportunity to travel and work with candidate uh, Bill Clinton uh, in 1992, my thought was, as I worked through that job in the campaign, that if I was given the opportunity to go into the White House, that I was going to shoot black and white documentary style. I mean, that was always the inspiration. And I was uh, you know, given that opportunity. Uh, I was asked to, after photographing the campaign, and then I, a campaign is a little different than actually in the White House documenting. When you're in a campaign, you make a lot of pictures for the campaign. You make a lot of poster-like pictures and pictures to make the guy look good. But the joy of going into the White House, that sort of falls away a little bit. I mean, there's, and I, I think everyone, the, uh, my uh, comrades in arms here, comrades in photography will agree, that the, there's a historical sense that it becomes, kind of this overriding understanding that, that this is uh, the record for grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, hundreds of years, and these, these pictures are a look that people aren't gonna, they just can't see, they're not gonna get see immediately, but in terms of history, and they, they do get more important as the year goes on. So I'm gonna start, this is actually during the uh, campaign. This is the, one of the first pictures, it might be, it's not the first frame, because I probably took one as he walked out on the set. I don't want to get caught like David w did there on the five presidents, you know, exactly what I took. <laughs> but um, <laughs> this is the first picture that I've printed, and really, this is the 1992 campaign. At this point, um, Bush 41 had about a 90% approval rating, and the candidates, the Democratic candidates, were called the Six Dwarfs. Um, for this debate. This was actually decision 92, but this debate was in 91. And they had put photographs in the chairs for the cameramen to sort of learn who the people were. They had no idea who the other candidates were. It was senators, congressmen, Jerry Brown, uh, different people, and this governor from Arkansas, Bill Clinton. And Clinton just walked out and in his just inimitable manner. I mean, he sat down, just sort of looked around, fixed his tie, and got ready to get down to business. I mean, he was he's a pretty incredible candidate. Uh, this is a photo I took in the White House. Uh, it's the cover of a book I did on Clinton. And this is the kind of photo, and in fact, I'm once again talking to Kennerly about digital, which is obviously the thing we always talk about. Man, digital's ruined photography, hasn't it? But anyway, this is taken with a Leica which is one of these instantaneous photos. I was following Clinton into the Oval Office, and it, the last moment as we went in, 
he spun around to say something behind, to someone behind me, and I just could bring up my Leica very quickly and shoot a, a frame without, it was already, I just threw the focus to as close as possible. I had the exposure set, and we we're talking about how with the digital cameras now, because of the necessity for the circuitry to even come online, you're supposed to depress the button like halfway before you shoot or something. It would have been a very difficult picture to make uh, digitally. So, and then, now this is pretty much, we're into the Carter White House, and um, Carter, Clinton White House, and um, there's sort of a chron chronological order to these. This is a very early picture, and it was utter chaos, as this picture is. This is about the first time President Clinton was going to address the nation. He's about three minutes, four minutes before going into the Oval to speak, and I, I mean, it's just, they're still arguing over what he's going to say. I just, I mean, he's yelling at Stan Greenberg, uh, George is yelling at somebody else, the vice president's in there, and I, I just love it. And then in the back is one of the White House stewards sort of, you know, looking in saying, boy, these guys are really at it, you know, disorganized. Then this, another thing is fun for all of us, and, and it's been mentioned by some of the folks here at the library listening to us talk, we all shoot the same picture in the same rooms at five-year intervals or 10 years intervals. This is the uh, incident in Somalia that was the, uh, became Black Hawk Down, became the movie. This was the uh, battle in Mogadishu where the uh, Rangers had gone in and had a couple helicopters shot down and uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs showing a very, you know, top secret map of where the troops are going and, uh, you know, just everybody just all of the president, the secretary of defense, uh, national security staff, the vice president, all, all looking at that. And then once again, I mean, the other thing, recurring people. Uh, Greenspan here during one of his briefings uh, on the economy. At the, and this is at the point where he still, you know, was reputed to know everything. Then there's a whole sequence kind of is, is in the White House. And, with Bill Clinton, there was always quite a few people around, but the thing you sense quite quickly is there's only one person who's important in the White House, and that's the president. And kind of everything revolves around him, you know, as he moves through that world. Uh, here's a meeting in the Oval Office on the economy. Uh, I think only one of those guys has been indicted so far. Uh, This is uh, after his uh, economic platform passed in 93, uh, end of 93 with, without a single Republican vote, uh, after the vote on the House floor. And this is uh, the Vice President pointing out this deal they can get where they get free 15-inch monitors for everybody in, the, everybody in the government. No, actually, he's, he's showing him an article in the New York Times, but I just love the seriousness here in, in This is the other thing about the sense of, of revolving around the president. I had a, a good friend one time when the West Wing was, a, everybody was watching the West Wing say, you know, how's that like what it was like in the White House? I said, well, the difference is obviously in the West Wing, all these other people seem to have some importance and they sort of, you follow them and they seem to have some weight. Where in the White House, in the West Wing itself, there, there is, as I said, just one person uh, and it's, you know, the president and everybody sort of keys on him. Whoops, too quick. How did I jump? Okay, this is, as I said, keys on him. I love this. There, there was a fourth guy, but he fell over. He, he leaned too far. No, actually, there was, only th there was only three, but just everybody wants to read what he's seeing, what he's doing. Now, this is, this is uh, I've sort of ruined this next, this, but this is a cabinet meeting, a very early cabinet meeting, and this is the president listening to uh, George Stephanopoulos. And then this is George listening to the president. <laughs> now, now this is one of these pictures, again, as I told you the story of the one that's the cover of my book. This is one where I'm standing there and Clinton had, has a very interesting temper. He's one of these people that you know when he's gonna get mad about three minutes before he does. You know, he starts and you can just tell. He's gonna crank himself up, he's gonna get angrier and angrier. So I was standing there and he started in on George, that's David Gergen, who was in the, the White House for a little while, standing next to him. 
And I could just tell, and he gets worked up, more worked up, and I'm standing over George's sh shoulder right there, and I've got the like, and I'm thinking, I really want to take this picture. And I'm also thinking, if he sees me take this picture, he's going to yell, it's going to be me. I mean, <laughs> forget George, I'm going to be the center of all this. But I'm standing there so real slowly, I bring the like up, shoot one frame, and put it down, and then, go, of course, go, whew, you know, just, but, and I didn't have time to frame it, or I would have had his arm in there a little bit. It's not a, you know, I didn't. Then this, this is another one of my favorite pictures of the president and George. <laughs> George was actually sitting up when the conversation started. <laughs> it's these relationships in there, that's, the, that's what we do. I mean, that's what we capture by being there. And I think that's historically what becomes important. I mean, this gives you a sense of who these people were and, and how it... I'm not doing this quite, oh, there we go. Then this is, he had this way of, you know, he'd get him, as I said, this was early on. I don't think he really was working himself up too much in that one. This is just sort of a half, half workup. Then this is a little sequence. This is Rahm Emanuel uh, in the hug. And this is Rahm after he had done something. He'd actually gotten the, uh, in 94, summer of 94, the uh, assault weapon ban through the Congress, which a lot of, Democrat, like Jack Brooks and different Democratic congressmen blamed for them losing their seat. But the president obviously is very, then another one with Rahm and Mike McCurry. And of course, Rahm, as David Kennerly with his pictures of, of course, Cheney and Rumsfeld and all these people, and of course, Scowcroft recurring. It's interesting to watch these people come in as young junior aides or, you know, aides to aides, and then watch their career. Another picture. Rom's a very interesting guy, obviously. Another Rom with, with uh, Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State, in the Oval. And then Rom, this is with Tony Blair. Uh, Rom at a meeting. And this is one of the things that Clinton did, one of his strengths. I mean, I've, I've obviously, I've done a lot of like casual comments and, you know, sort of these other pictures. But there was some real strengths that, that Clinton had as president. And one of them was his ability to bring people together and talk to them and, and, and be really immersed in something. I mean, he would read, if he was involved in, well, I can remember one of the points very early on with the war in the Balkans was still going on when we came into the White House. And at one point, I happened to notice on the edge of the Oval Office desk were two stacks, probably, 12 to 18 inches high of books, all on the Balkan Wars, uh, history of the Balkans, current history of the Balkans, profiles of different things. And I, I happened to say to you know, the president, I said, you know, that's interesting. I mean, that's a lot of books. Which one, I don't have as much, I don't have a lot of time to read, and which one would you recommend? And he reached in there and brought out a book called Balkan Ghosts by, I think it's something Kaplan, Peter Kaplan. So anyway, it's a wonderful book. He said, here, read this one. If you've only got one to read. But on the Middle East, uh, he immersed himself in the Middle East. He knew every square inch of Gaza and, and Jerusalem and all of the land issues and everything. And when Netanyahu, I mean, here again, recurring world history, Netanyahu is now the uh, prime minister and, you know, giving everyone fits. Uh, very kind of ornery human being. I was, I'm not a big fan. But anyway, in this particular time, King Hussein and President Clinton brought Arafat and Netanyahu together because they wouldn't talk. There was no communication. So they invited them to Washington, sat them down. At this point, Netanyahu's talking. And then Arafat's talking. I mean, at least gets the conversation going. I mean, this, it didn't resolve anything at that point. Now, this is another of that same kind of example. This is in Northern Ireland um, and dealing with the Protestant and Catholic issue there, of course, hundreds of years of, of conflict. And the president went there, and there was a reception, and he invited Ian Paisley and the, the Protestant uh, political organization and uh, Jerry Adams and the uh, uh, Catholic to this reception, but they wouldn't come at the same time. They, they wouldn't be in the, the same building together. So that Paisley and his people came early, the first hour, sat, and then same chairs, Paisley had sat in that chair, Jerry Adams came in, and they sat there and they talked. Now, they actually, 
this did move the process forward. It would have been probably, well, it wouldn't have worked to get them together because they just would have yelled or whatever. It was, and it was a fascinating study in terms of the personalities and the way they viewed the conflict. Uh, Ian Paisley, uh, very Protestant, very cold, very sort of uh, authoritarian, not humorless, just telling anecdotes. The Catholics were terrible. It was all their fault. They'd done this. Jerry Adams coming in, of course, saying that just the f reverse, you know, the Protestants are terrible, but always with jokes. I mean, he was very much the Irish storyteller. It was, it was a fascinating. Um, then with uh, Slobodan Milosevic at the uh, Paris Peace Talks, the only time the two of them were ever together. Then this is the... Uh, President of China about to go into a, uh, the White House briefing room or over in the old EOB. I love this just because uh, of his haircut. I think that's one of the classic presidential haircuts. I mean, they put a bowl on there? And what exactly did they do? <laughs> and this is one of the reasons I, I got into the White House photography thing. There, there was a, uh, now I'm going to have a senior moment, the um, gentleman in the 20s with the first Leica who was the, the classic black and white. He was a, a diplomat, excuse me? Eric Solomon. Solomon, thank you, Dave. Uh, Eric Solomon, his pictures, uh, with the, when the Leica was invented, the Leica camera, of course, was the first camera to take 35 millimeter movie film and run it through a still camera and make these, and just, you know, be portable and, and make these wonderful photographs. And Solomon had these extraordinary pictures through the 30s and of the, um, in Germany and all through Europe. And they'd let him in. He always wore a tuxedo. And he, he, you know, he looked like one of, the, one of the, and was, you know, invited. But this is a, a G8 meeting, a economic summit in Denver. And uh, this is the informal dinner, Yeltsin, uh, Cole, Tony Blair. But it's sort of, I mean, this is the thing that Clinton could do. I mean, this jacket's off. This dinner went on for hours. Uh, over a, lot, a huge range of issues. And then early in his presidency, Richard Nixon came to call late one night, slunk into the White House for a meeting. You know, it was interesting. I don't mean to make fun of him, but he came after dark, came up West Exec, was un, you know, unannounced as far as to the press, and they went up into the residence, and he wanted to talk about foreign policy in China and Russia. I mean, an interesting. And then this is my five presidents. This was uh, the signing of NAFTA in, in the uh, White House. This is like everybody, I mean, like we all have had these moments. You're standing around with a bunch of people. Nobody knows quite what to say or quite what to do, although these are in the Oval. I mean, they're all sort of like, you know, well, what now? And I, I just love uh, Bush 41 over there. He's like, what did I have over in that corner? I can't, I can't remember what I, what I did. But they're just sort of this sort of pregnant pause. Now, this is a little sequence that obviously one of the things that shaped the Clinton years was his relationship with Newt Gingrich. And of course, they had a, a lot in common, as well as a lot not in common, <laughs> including their bellies, um, both Southern boys. Uh, but it was an interesting relationship, and they face-to-face -face got along. I mean, it was interesting how long they would talk and go over things. And there was this whole sequence around, of course, the shutdown of the government which the shutdown of the government led to one other little problem that Clinton had. But anyway, in this particular instance, it helped shape and, and give form to his presidency. And Newt would come down for these meetings on the budget and getting the government open, and Clinton would just spin this, this web. You can see his little diagram there on the desk. I mean, he, you know, taxes go up and expenditures go here, and we do this and we do that. And Newt would just sit there and, and just sort of absorb it all and then go try to repeat it to the freshmen, all those house freshmen. And they were like, you drank the Kool-Aid, buddy, man. This is, <laughs> we're not going to do that. And, uh, you know, and, he, they, and he, that, you know, Newt had his turn to talk. Reub, Bob Rubin doesn't think much of what he's saying, I don't think, back there. <laughs> Then it sort of came to a head. This was uh, a picture taken on Air Force One on the way to Rabin's funeral after uh, Prime Minister Rabin was assassinated. And uh, Speaker of the House, Majority Leader, of course, Newton, and uh, Tom Daschle, who is now Minority Leader, former Secretary of State George Shultz. And they're flying over there, and Bob Dole sort of looking over saying, hmm, I don't know if this picture is going get to get us in trouble, I think, sometime. They actually, then they had a briefing in the cabinet room and everybody's same sort of cast of characters. Well, we came back from this trip. This was one of those 
crazy presidential trips where we flew all night from Washington, land in Israel in the morning, go to the funeral. The president had some quick meetings with, with the government. Um, Shimon Peres had stepped in. Um, Newt and the other people had meetings with some of the, the Knesset and everything. Got back on the plane, flew back, landed in the middle of the night, two or three in the morning, and everybody sort of stumbled off and left. Well, a day and a half later, I'm driving into work at the White House, and I, I've got the radio on to NPR, and Newt had made the statement that uh, they were going to keep the government shut down because President Clinton had been rude to Senator Dolan himself on the trip to um, Israel. He hadn't listened to him. So I drove into the office and I went into Mike McCurry's office and I said, uh, Mike, I heard this thing that Newt said and I've got all these pictures, as you recall, and you know, I've got this one and I've got lots, but you know, and I've got this one. If I can get to that one again, come on. And um, Mike, <laughs> who's a very funny guy, very entertaining, says, well, Bob, why don't you just print up a couple, you know, a couple stacks of those and see if anybody wants to look at them. <laughs> so, called up my lab and, and had these stacks of pictures and um, walked up to the press office when I had them. They made an announcement into the press office that Bob McNeely has some pictures of the president and Newt Gingrich and Bob Dole on Air Force One going to Rabin's funeral. And as I walk into the Oval Office, it's like a scrum, like a rugby scrum. I mean, the pictures are flying everywhere and people are grabbing them. And, you know, about two seconds, they're all gone. And I walk back to the White House photo office, which used to be very conveniently located, very nice office right below the Oval. And um, by the time I get there, Wolf Blitzer has run onto the South Lawn and is holding these pictures up live on CNN. And so that sort of, that occurred, and they sort of had to backtrack from that. Well, then about a week later, they're finishing, still negotiating, the government's still closed. They come to terms at the end of a meeting in the Oval Office and shake on it. This is, they've all agreed, okay, we're gonna reopen, we're gonna pass this, reopen the government. And I was on the other side of the room as they started this with Clinton shaking hands with Gingrich and Gordon Dole and ran around, sort of knocked two people to the ground to get over here and make this one. So the next day I'm driving into work and on the radio it says, yeah, there was sort of a half deal made, but it's falling apart. The deal's falling apart. So I go and saw Mike again. I said, Mike, I got a picture. They shook on that deal last night. Says, well, Bob, why don't you make up a few pictures and see if anybody wants to see them? Well, as an end result, government's still closed. They're going to come, the Republicans are going to come back down in a couple of days, and McCurry calls out and says, uh, they won't come if you take any more pictures. <laughs> so, and now this is a little sequence just of things that go on. Every year, everybody, all these guys have all photographed this. The White House Christmas tree in the blue room, it's unveiled. Uh, and this is the first time the president sees it. And, I just love his body language. I mean, this is archetypal Bill Clinton, uh, you know, the little boy, never had a, much of a tree, you know, working mother. And he just, I just love the way he's looking at it. And of course, right behind him, Mrs. Clinton walks in, starts rearranging it. <laughs> so this leads into a little sequence. I mean, obviously, she's a very strong personality, a very big part of that presidency, a big part of American history, and a big part of this presidency. But an interesting lady, I mean, very, has her own, Here's her own drummer, definitely. This is the first healthcare speech when he, she had worked on healthcare, uh, working on it in the car before he goes in to deliver it. This is after his first State of the Union uh, in 93, coming back down. This is right before his State of the Union in 98, after in January there'd been the announcement of a certain young intern than the president, and he'd gone up to do this. I just, everybody else sort of has, a, they all have this thousand yard stare. I think Bill Clinton had finally pushed them all over the edge there. Mrs. Clinton, Rahm. Uh, and this is actually earlier, and the two pictures, is funny going back through this material. I know Ken, who's um, David's picture person at the, at the library in Ann Arbor, knows David's picture so well and finds this kind of stuff. I just happened to find this the other day. This is during the travel office uh, problems early on in the Clinton administration when Hillary was in the middle of it. And this, this gentleman here uh, is uh, Fowler, Vince Fo uh, Foster, who committed suicide within about a, a couple weeks after that or within about a month. I mean, it was the whole, and it's the same stare. It's that same 
sort of overwhelming and I think the most telling part of this is, is what the president, president's like, hey, you guys got a problem, you know, and I, it's your problem. I mean, he's, he's leaving it to them. Whoops, come on. Then this is a, a moment I'm going out onto the South Lawn from the diplomatic entrance earlier in the presidency. This is a uh, meeting in the Oval Office, just President and First Lady actually sitting together listening to the planning for the Clinton Library. Then this is a picture in, in 98 towards the last, as I left in August of 98. This is uh, very telling. This is after the whole scandal and everything is sort of engulfing his presidency. And this is just one of the last frames. This is campaigning in 96, you know, Clinton, the eternal ca campaigner. And that's basically it. Look forward to your questions. We'll get to that. And Eric Draper, who uh, was for eight years a photographer for Bush 43, will now show some of his pictures. Eric, sorry. It's okay. Good job. Okay. Um, so um, it's great to be back here in um, Grand Rapids. And um, actually, I've, I've come full circle because um, uh, Ken really touched on my background. I was a, a staff photographer with the Associated Press, and I was assigned to cover the Bush campaign back in um, 1999 for the, the 2000 election. And um, uh, so they assigned me to cover the campaign, and Grand Rapids was the very first city that I stayed at. I actually stayed in the hotel, uh, the Grand um, uh, Hotel uh, across the river there. So, uh, so it's really great to be back here, and, uh, and who would have thought, you know, that that beginning of that assignment would, first of all, lead me to the White House. Uh, but then, now I'm back again to tell my story of uh, my eight years, uh, which uh, was an incredible, incredible ride. Um, and I, I'll tell you the story about how I got my White House job. Um, every White House photographer has their, their road to the White House. And uh, just like I said, uh, with the Associated Press, uh, I covered the campaign. and. And I didn't really uh, plan on being at the White House. It was one of these things that uh, it, I was in the right place at the right time. And I didn't start thinking about the job until after the election, to be honest. You might remember this little thing called uh, the recount. <laughs> so actually, I blame everything on the recount because that gave me the time to think about pursuing the job. You know, it was, it was like a two to three week period. And when I found out that I actually had a shot at getting the job, um, uh, just by a stroke of luck, I discovered that I was invited to a Christmas party in Austin, Texas at the governor's mansion. And uh, uh, they say, you know, timing is everything. So uh, President-elect Bush, um, had, he just became President-elect Bush, and Gore had just conceded. Um, and so I said, well, this is my shot. This is my chance to, to uh, get the job. Uh, and I was going to make the personal pitch. So at the party, I, I walked up to President-elect Bush, and I, uh, I stole a page from his campaign playbook because he used to have a slogan. He would say, I'm going to look you in the eye and ask you for the job. I want to be your president. And that's what I did. <laughs> so I, um, I looked him in the eye, and I said, I want to be your personal photographer. And I didn't blink. And uh, he, he looked away and said, oh, I really appreciate that. Uh, I'll get back to you. And, and I was prepared. You know, I had a portfolio that I left with the staff. And a week later, I get a call from uh, Chief of Staff's Andy, Andy Card's office for an interview back in Austin. And he pretty much offered me the job on the spot. Um, and uh, so that's how I became the White House photographer. And something I'll never forget, uh, what Andy Card told me during that interview in Austin, he said, Working at the White House is like trying to drink water through a fire hose at full throttle. <laughs> and he was right. <laughs> so, um, so let me throw some events at you. 9-11, uh, the war in Afghanistan, the shuttle Columbia disaster, funerals for two presidents and a pope, another close presidential election, the worst U.S. natural disaster in history, 
the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. Um, there was a joke running around the White House, uh, especially towards the end, was, okay, now is the time for aliens to land on the South Lawn. <laughs> so I traveled to nearly uh, 70 countries with President Bush. During my eight years, I made nearly one million images. And for all you techies out there, the storage for the digital photo database came in around 50 terabytes. As a photojournalist, I really relished the moments, the surprise moments. Um, by the way, this is uh, the president driving his truck on his ranch in Crawford. This, is, uh, this photo was made in 2001. And uh, the ranch was the only place where the president can actually drive. Um, you know, and he, he, really, he really liked it. And, uh, but the moments that you just can't plan for. That was a surprise. You all might remember that. Like I said, timing is everything. Get it? Um, and sometimes you just get lucky and you're know, in the right place at the right time. This is back in uh, Crawford. And then there are the moments that I could plan for, like the first entry into the Oval Office for the 43rd President of the United States. And uh, by the way, my office was located in the basement of the West Wing, and it was the old barber shop. And uh, my desk sat in front of the mirror that was still there, the original mirror. And I was literally 10 seconds away from the Oval Office. So um, if I had to get there in a hurry, uh, I would sprint up the stairs, through the hall, through the outer oval where the president's personal secretary sat, and into the oval. Um, there were a lot of firsts uh, involved uh, at the beginning of the administration. And actually, this was day one. Uh, and this is the first signature as president after being sworn in. This is also on day one. This is actually, this is in the evening uh, during the inaugural balls. And this is after the President and Mrs. Bush attended nearly 22 inaugural balls. And this is the last ride to the last ball. And actually, what I really love about this picture is it, it's, it really is a good illustration of their personalities because President Bush was an extrovert. I mean, he's just out there. And um, Mrs. Bush is more reserved. This is the first landing of Marine One on the South Lawn, uh, a view from inside the, uh, the Black Hawk helicopter. But nothing could prepare me for September 11th, 2001. I was with the president at the elementary school in Sarasota, Flor Sarasota Florida. Um, and the images you're going to see are the behind the scenes images and, and also some images from the days that followed 9 11. Um, and this image was taken approximately 9 14 a.m. when the president returned to the hold room after leaving the classroom. And um, there was a television in the hold room that had a live view of the towers on fire. And um, the president went immediately to the corner of the room to pick up the the, mo the notepad he has in his hands to start writing to prepare for his uh, statement, ba basically the first statement to the world in reaction to the attacks. And I was waiting for the moment for the president to look up and to look at the television, but he never did. Approximately 9.17, uh, the president here is pictured with uh, Press Secretary Ari Fleischer on the left Communications Director Dan Bartlett, um, and then Carl Rove is on the right, and then the, the, the gentleman in the back, uh, in the, the far right, that's um, uh, a Secret Service agent, uh, Eddie Marenzo. Now, the, the first few moments uh, behind the scenes uh, in terms of what was really happening in that room, um, 
there were a lot of, uh, everyone was gathering information. Everyone was on a cell phone. And this, this is before the, the Blackberry days. So, you know, we had pagers, we had cell phones. Um, and you can see everyone's trying to, trying to get to information in terms of what was really happening. And, um, and everything was, was focused on New York. Um, and approximately 9.25 a.m., communications director Dan Bartlett alerts everyone in the room to look at the television because they were doing a, having replays of the, uh, the second tower uh, getting hit. And the president turns and sees for the very first time the image of Flight 175 hitting the South Tower. And like I said, uh, everyone was focused on New York because uh, you know, no one knew how wide the, the, the attacks, I mean, no one knew what the, what the, how the day would unfold, and no one knew the scope of what was to come. Aboard Air Force One, approximately 10 a.m., the Vice President has been evacuated from the West Wing to a secure location. Flight 77 has, cr has crashed into the Pentagon. Flight 93 has been hijacked. The entire U.S. airspace has been shut down. And this discussion going on here, uh, this is, this is the, the President's personal area on Air Force One uh, at the nose of the plane. Uh, turned to the, the president's safety because the president really wanted to return to Washington, but he was advised against it, and he wasn't happy. Um, I remember also on the plane there were all these false reports flying around the plane, like a car bomb uh, at the State Department, uh, a fast-moving flying object headed toward the president's ranch in Texas. Uh, this is all false. Um, and then there was a moment when the president came rushing out of his cabin and he said that I just heard that Angel is the next target and Angel is the code name for Air Force One. And the president's on the phone, uh, I believe he was speaking with the vice president and um, on the right going on here are uh, his staff trying to decide where to go because no one knew where we were going to. We, were, we knew we were in the air and we knew we were, you know, somewhat safe because we were flying. Um, but um, uh, involved in that conversation are the, the military aide and the, uh, the director of the White House military office in the far right. And Andy Card is there pictured as well as uh, the president's Secret Service agent. Approximately 10.20 a.m., Flight 93 has crashed in Pennsylvania. Approximately 10.30, the President and staff watched the live TV coverage of the collapse of the Twin Towers. This image shows uh, the President with Chief of Staff Andy Card, and this is around the moment that we learned that we're headed to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. And. Um, on the, the tarmac uh, after we landed, the White House staff and the press we were ushered onto buses, and you can see the, 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 uh, the armored uh, military personnel were surrounding the plane, kind of swarming the plane. And the president, actually, he was already gone. He was, they put him in an armed Humvee, and they headed directly to um, a place, uh, you know, just you know, for safety. I mean, because you know, no one knew what, you know, what was, what was going to happen next. Um, at Barksdale, uh, this is where the President received his very first, uh, like a full briefing via teleconference about the uh, situation. And we were on the ground for nearly uh, two hours um, in Louisiana. Uh, and the President also did another statement to the press about the attacks um, as well in Barksdale. And our second stop was Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska where the president received another top secret briefing, this time from military commanders. Uh, 
back on the plane, uh, we left Nebraska and we finally learned that we were headed home to Washington. And this image shows the Air Force One crew gathered in the conference room of Air Force One. And at this time, everyone was still trying to figure out this, the situation in Washington, what was going on in New York. Um, uh, and this is before Air Force One was equipped with, with satellite TV, because after 9-11, they up, uh, Air Force One was upgraded because of all the, all the telecommunications needed an upgrade. And what made the day even more surreal was the fact that in order to receive television reception, we had to fly over a major city. And so all day long, the, the news reports were you know, fading in and fading out, and it was really just made it even more surreal. The president making a phone call uh, during our final approach to Washington with uh, speaking with the vice president back at the White House. The president comforts Harriet Myers, who was the White House staff secretary at the time. On our approach to Andrews Air Force Base, the president and staff noticed the F-16 uh, fighter jets escorting us back to Washington. And that's the scene out of the left side of the plane as we approached Washington. And the fighter jets were literally almost like touching the wing of Air Force One. And on the right side, I could see the plume of smoke coming up from the Pentagon as we approached Washington. And in my mind, uh, it, it really felt like we were, we were truly at war. Back at the White House, and this is inside the Presidential Emergency Operations Center, um, under the White House. And the President and the Vice President are finally meeting face to face, discussing the situation and how to respond to what had happened that day. And this is later in the evening, probably around 6, 6 p.m. Um, The next morning, September 12th, this image shows National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice watching the sun rise as the President speaks with Prime Minister Tony Blair about the attacks. Also on September 12th, the President visits the Pentagon for the very first time to see the, 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 the destruction firsthand, and he also thanked a lot of the uh, the rescue crews and the fire crews. September 14th, the day of national prayer. And this was the moment after the president addressed the, the crowd gathered inside the National Cathedral. And this is the moment also when his dad reached out to touch his hand after he returned to his seat. Also on September 14th, the, the, tre the, excuse me, the president traveled to Ground Zero, and this image was made aboard Marine One, and we were actually flying over the Pentagon at this moment, and the president was looking out the window, and you might notice this was also the first day that the president started wearing the lapel pin, the flag pin. The president at Ground Zero that same day um, on the, the pile of rubble with the firefighter. And several weeks later, I didn't realize that they're actually standing on a fire truck that was crushed. The president spent nearly three hours with the families of the World Trade Center victims. And this is probably the, the toughest situation for me to photograph in uh, just because of the, the, the immense sorrow involved in the emotion, um, the, 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 the sadness, uh, along with like hope that maybe they would find survivors. I mean, this is only three days after the attacks. Um, and what was really sad was watching the family members carry uh, like pictures of their, the missing. They were carrying uh, little handmade signs of their names. Uh, and some of the signs read, you know, have you seen my mother? Have you seen my father? Um, it was very, very, very intense. And it was really hard to make a lot of pictures in this situation. So I, um, I, you know, I had a Leica camera, 
you know, and I would, you know, it was really hard to raise the camera to, to make a picture, but uh, I made one. September 20th, uh, this is the first face-to-face -face meeting with Prime Minister Tony Blair, uh, and they're discussing the attacks. And this is also the day that President Bush addressed a joint session of Congress about the attacks. The first week in October, uh, the President is receiving a uh, CIA briefing from Director George Tenet on the right there, and they're looking at a map of Af Afghanistan. And this is also the moment that they asked me to leave to, to uh, leave the room. October 7th, the president collects his thoughts before announcing military operations at the start of the Afghanistan war. And uh, by the way, this is the, the inside the treaty room um, in the residence of the White House. And you might remember uh, David Valdez's image of uh, President Bush 41, as we call him, receiving um, a military briefing in that same area. And uh, it just kind of shows you that the, how interesting uh, the lineage, lineage uh, and the connection, you know, what happens uh, you know, after uh, generations of, of presidents. And, you know, really interesting um, now that the son is handling a, a crisis. Um, President Bush holds the badge of New York Port Authority Officer George Howard, given to him by his mother during his trip to Ground Zero. The President carried this badge um, as a memory of the attacks, and he carried it for weeks and, and, and months following the attacks as a reminder. And uh, so down the road, I felt it was very important to not only photograph the badge, but photograph it in his hand. So one day, I, I asked the President, and in the Oval Office, I said, can I photograph the badge? And he, he simply said, yes. And um, so he walked over to a window, he pulled it out of his pocket, and I made my picture. Thank you. And uh, <coughs> David Kennerly is back. He's back. <laughs> that my clicker, please? Thank you. Good job. Thank you, Eric. That, that was, uh, Eric gave a talk in um, Atlanta. Uh, we were both uh, on a, a se separate program at a, at a press conference thing, and I saw his picture. He did a, a great job in eight years over there, and uh, um, you could see the intensity of that time, and that, that was what I particularly wanted him to talk about. And then moving on to actually the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq, he's got all that behind the scenes stuff, but we can only go through so many wars here at a time. So um, I'm going to very quickly, because Pete Souza is not here today, um, I'm going to just uh, do a little bit of what I shot. I, I, uh, and McNeely and I and the other uh, two guys, Valdez um, and Draper, if you want them uh, to sign also, well, we've got the Barack Obama book, the official book. Um, this is my last five presidents photo, by the way. <laughs> I just can't get enough of this stuff. Uh, but this was January 7th in the Oval Office. Eric was there. Uh, but this was the fifth time that five presidents had been together, and only the second time, really, there was a posed shot. The very first, as you remember, was Valdez's of the five presidents <laughs> at the Reagan Library. And... Um, but this is the Oval Office, and it was a uh, uh, really great moment. And what struck me was how o o President-elect Obama really fit into that scene. And what you can't see from this angle is the fact that uh, President Carter was standing about this far away from Clinton, and it was very obvious in the head-on shot. There was this, uh, you could have put another president in there. And, uh, <laughs> and Mike Lukovic uh, did this cartoon. Mike's a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner. I loved it because everybody's got a camera now. Uh, we were talking about that earlier. We are being phased out as uh, photographers. This is the book. Um, Tom Brokaw uh, wrote the foreword. John Lewis, a great civil rights uh, figure. Uh, uh, and Douglas Brinkley wrote a, a nice piece. I, I did the cover picture, but we had 20 photographers working on the book. Bob McNeely and I produced it. 
And um, I'll just show you a few that I shot. If Sousa were here, I wouldn't be doing this, but uh, just to give you some idea of the pe people, this was two days before the inauguration at the mall, Lincoln Mall. Uh, were, did anybody go to the inauguration in this room? Yeah, it's Grand Rapids, you know. Uh, <laughs> I didn't vote for him either, right? <laughs> uh, just kidding. I'm, like, I'm still a Ford guy, so. Um, Oh, nice. Well, that's good. Well, in fact, the last time I spoke here, um, we got the overflow from a big Obama event just down the street, and so we had a full house, you know, so I can thank him for that. This is at the event uh, on the mall on uh, Lincoln Memorial um, two days before, and this woman came out, and I'm up on the stage, and I'm an official photographer, and I, I had no idea who this was, and I was standing next to Denzel Washington. I said, wow, man, who's that? And uh, he said, that's Beyonce, you idiot, you know, like uh, <laughs> unspoken, but I could hear it without him saying it. And there's me and Denzel, I have him out manned. Uh, my Canon 1 to 400 millimeter lens is better than his cell phone shot. And uh, uh, we were talking, I've been uh, five times when presidents walked out. This is uh, uh, George W. Bush leaving the White House for the last time as president and, and Barack Obama walking around. And, and I think McNeely had said when he saw that picture that that's the last time that Obama will ever walk around to the other side of the car because the president always goes directly from wherever he is into the car. But uh, George W. Bush never looked back. And as uh, Eric knows, that's the kind of guy he was. He got into the car, they drove up. I kept looking to see if he was going to look back. But I stuck around the White House to see that transition and there's Eric and President Bush in the helicopter uh, taking that one last ride uh, uh, past the Capitol in the White House. And, and it was moving day. While Dad's getting sworn in as president, all the family stuff is being brought into the White House. This is out and back on the South Portico. How many GSA employees does it take to change the phone from <laughs> Rove to Emmanuel? You know, this is what they were doing, literally. And then as the President Obama was being sworn in, I took this picture right, uh, this little anti-office right off the Oval Office in the uh, uh, Rose Garden. And then the, inaugura the inaugural parade. <laughs> and I was in, that, this is where I took the, the portrait that ran on the cover of the book. And then I followed them around to all the balls and already they had their picture up uh, on the, uh, 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 at the Washington Hilton probably. Michelle Obama does not like the picture, would be my guess. <laughs> then coming out to one of the balls, that's all you see anymore. It's like, like little digital cameras. Very similar to uh, Valdez's picture of these balls. Uh, there were 10 inaugural balls that night. And um, this picture was in a freight elevator at the uh, uh, Washington uh, Convention Center. And it was really a moment, it was, it was almost like prom night where the gallant date has given uh, his girlfriend his coat. And, um, but it was, a, I don't know the Obamas, I didn't cover the campaign, but this is a revealing moment for me. There were several other people in the elevator, including uh, Pete Souza uh, and uh, Kelly Shell, who'd been covering the election for Time Magazine. But they had their own moment. This is one of the things that all these guys will tell you, that uh, these moments come, even if there are other staff around and all that, they kind of tune them out. Mrs. Obama had enough inaugural ball, balls for the evening, and this is uh, just before the last one. It's not as good as the yawning shut, <laughs> but this was the last moment that uh, this is 1 o'clock in the morning, and they were entering the White House for the first time as uh, the first couple, uh, which is a significant historical moment. That's it. So we're going to take questions. We're going to do a little rearranging here and uh, lights can come up and thank you very much.